Hi everybody, good morning, my name is Nadav, and together with Roman, uh, we'll tell you about optimizing neural networks with GLOW. So what are neural networks? Neural networks are graphs where uh, each, each node in the graph is some mathematical operation that works on matrices. Um, you can think of things like matrix multiplications and convolutions. Neural networks can be trained to do cool things like detecting things in images or translating text between different languages or uh, detecting uh, bots that try to influence the elections. Um, now, neural networks uh, require a lot of compute power to execute because they operate on pretty large matrices. And I'll give you a quick example. Um, ResNet 50 is a very popular neural network. It operates on about 100 megabytes of, of weights. That's, that's pretty big. Um, these weights are constant matrices that are used in the calculation of the, uh, of the neural network. So this is why neural networks take a lot of compute power to execute. Uh, now compilers can improve things. They can make neural networks more efficient. And this is why we're here today to tell you about the work that we're doing um, in, on GLOW as part of the PyTorch project. So PyTorch is a machine learning framework. Um, it is one of the most popular uh, open source projects in the world. It is a machine learning framework that's used by Facebook and other companies for both uh, research and production applications. It comes with a family of tools and libraries that make researchers very productive, and it later it helps them to um, um, move and take their ideas from research uh, to production. Now, PyTorch gives researchers a familiar Python-based environment where they can um, compute uh, and create the neural network graph. Um, they can build the neural network graph in one of two ways. First, they can use something that's similar to the LVM IR builder to create node, create node, create node, and this way build the neural network graph. But there's also another way that they can, compute, they can, that they can program the neural network, which is uh, the define by run. They write code that's similar to NumPy, and PyTorch creates the neural network for them um, automatically. Later, they, they can take that graph, serialize it, execute it, and, and optimize it. So this is PyTorch. Now, Facebook, at Facebook, we serve um, billions of users across a bunch of different services. Many of these services use AI. Now, at this scale, when you serve billions of users, you cannot afford to be inefficient. Unfortunately, CPUs and GPUs are not efficient. They're not good at executing neural networks. And I'll give you a very quick example. So I have a laptop here. Um, the processor on this laptop is Intel Skylake. Um, it has two cores. Um, it has two FMA ports um, that can execute uh, eight wide SIMD, um, and it runs at four gigahertz. So let's multiply all of these numbers together. So four gigahertz times eight wide SIMD times two FMA ports times two cores. When you add these numbers together, you, you get less than one teraflop. Now, for the same power budget, you can do about 100 times better with a better architecture. So CPUs and GPUs are not efficient, um, partially because they solve a different problem. The key to performance is parallelism. And CPUs and GPUs work really hard to extract parallelism from C programs. Think about your standard uh, programming language like uh, C or JavaScript. It has features like uh, exception handling and V tables and you know and uh, a bunch of other things that that make the processors work work really hard. And CPUs have things like um, load store forwarding optimizations and um, branch predictors and out of order engines and all of these things are really not necessary when you optimize neural network neural networks. Uh, or even caches, um, neural networks are really easy to optimize, but you need a different architecture. CPUs and GPUs are not the right answer. You need accelerators. Accelerators are efficient because they're specialized. So how do you build an, an efficient neural network accelerator? Well, it's actually not that hard. The first thing that you do is instead of having a small number of arithmetic execution units, you put a lot of them, hundreds. And then you take these uh, execution units and you surround them by local memories. These are not caches. These are software-managed SRAM that can feed these execution units. Next, you reduce the arithmetic bit width. 
um, which is the, the kind of arithmetic operation that you're doing. You don't need to operate on floats and doubles. You can, you can work on FP16 or maybe even int8 in some cases. And finally, something that's very important for all of us is you need to come up with a domain-specific language or uh, a custom compiler pipeline. You can't just program these accelerators in, in C or, or JavaScript or some other languages. You need to have a dedicated compiler pipeline. Now, um, last month, the Facebook VP of Infrastructure, Jason Taylor, announced that Facebook will be working with partners on building hardware accelerators. We'll be making uh, these accelerators available through the Open Compute Initiative. Glow is the project that will drive these accelerators. It is the software stack and compiler to make sure that you can take the PyTorch uh, neural network graph and execute them on the accelerators. The rest of this talk will be about the structure of the Glow compiler. So this is Glow. It's built like a pretty standard compiler. On the left, you can see um, the front end. Glow can load um, a number of different neural network formats that, that PyTorch supports. Glow has a powerful optimizer, um, a profile-guided profile quantizer that we'll talk about later, and a reusable code generator. It also supports a number of different code generators, uh, a number of different backends that can generate code for different accelerators. As of today, we were able to run code on CPUs, GPUs, and four different hardware accelerators. Now let's talk about the com compilation pipeline. We start the compilation pipeline with a high-level IR. This high-level IR gives you the ability to perform mathematical high-level domain-specific optimizations. You can think about it as the uh, kind of transformations you learn about in the linear algebra class. Next, we transform the graph into low-level IR. This low-level IR gives us the ability to perform low-level memory optimizations. Um, and finally, we transition the graph into an optional accelerator-specific IR that you can, you can uh, tailor to the needs of specific accelerators. So this gives you the ability to perform uh, very, very targeted specific optimizations. <laughs> Let's start by looking at the high-level IR. On the right, you can see a picture of the graph. This is a node-based data flow statically typed IR. You can look at the, some of the nodes and some of the operations in, in, in this graph. Um, like I said before, it gives you the ability to perform high-level domain-specific optimizations. Um, imagine that you have a matrix multiplication that's followed by the scaling operation. So you want to multiply all of the elements by two. Well, one of the optimizations that we have is that we take these two nodes and modify the weights of the matrix multiplication and then get rid of the scaling operation. So these are kind of the optimizations that we do on the high-level IR. Some of the other optimizations that we do is we get rid of the transpose operation. We also change the layout of, of matrices to make them more efficient, to make it more efficient for the hardware to, uh, to access these matrices. Next, we, tra we transition to the low-level IR. We have a scheduler that, attempt that linearizes this graph and attempts to reduce memory pressure. This is an instruction-based, address-only um, um, intermediate representation. Each instruction has access to or references uh, strongly typed buffers. This gives us the ability to perform low-level memory optimizations, like reusing buffers or shortening the lifetime of buffers. This is not something that you can do at the high-level graph representation, because at the high-level representation, we don't have access to, um, to buffers. It's not a concept that exists. It only exists in the second part of the compilation pipeline. OK, something else that's cool about our IR is the way that we handle um, the hundreds of operators that exist in modern machine learning frameworks. So when you look at uh, CAFE or, or PyTorch or other frameworks, they have hundreds of operators that are typically implemented in C and CUDA. Now, think about the challenge of, trend of porting your framework from one architecture to the next. You, you have to re-implement 400 operators. That's a major challenge. Now, as we said in the beginning of the talk, we need to support a number of different accelerators. 
So just copying and modifying and porting uh, each one of these operators one by one is not a scalable solution. So we have a different solution. What we do is we take these high-level operators and we break them down into low-level uh, linear algebra primitives. Now, after you do this, this um, after you break down these, these high-level operations into low-level primitives, the code that, that's generated is less efficient. But this is a compiler problem that we know how to solve, right? So this is good news. And later in this talk, Roman will tell you exactly how we do this, how we take these uh, low-level primitives and how we make them run fast or as fast or even faster than their orig original shape. Okay, so something else that's cool about um, our compiler is that, so we have all of these nodes and all of these instructions, and these are classes with a bunch of methods, like the hash method or the print method, we have setters and getters, we have the comparison, and a bunch of optimizations use these, these methods, methods. For example, CSE needs to check if two nodes are identical or not, right? But um, writing all of these methods in, by hand is it's a lot of work. So instead, we came up with a very, very simple domain-specific language that allows us to auto-generate everything. And on the screen, you can see um, the definition for our convolution node. It's very simple and uh, easy to read. And it, we even generate the uh, doxygen strings for, for these nodes. OK, now let's talk about something serious, quantization. Neural networks are typically trained in 32-bit floating points. But neural networks are resilient. They can also um, operate on int 8s or uh, FP16s, which are reduced uh, arithmetic, which are more efficient. They're, more, they're, they're easier to execute. They're more power efficient. Now, quantization is the process of taking the neural network and converting it from floating point to int 8, to integer. The idea is to take some, some range of the real numbers and represent it with, with a reduced bit width integer using some scale and offset. So this is a lot more efficient, easier to implement in hardware. In Glow, we use profile-guided profile optimizations to estimate the range of values that travel across the different edges. And after we know the possible range of integers, uh, I'm sorry, the possible range of numbers across these edges, we can come up with the, with the ideal scale and offset that would utilize um, the 8-bit integer in the best way to improve the precision and, and performance. Um, now, naturally, after each one of these transitions, we have to rescale the values after each, each node and each operation in the network. And we have sophisticated compiler optimizations to eliminate these transitions and make the code a lot more efficient. Now, Roman will tell you more about how we use LVM um, in, in the Glow compiler, and we'll tell you about some of the challenges that we have when we generate code for accelerators. Hi, <laughs> Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Roman. I will start with describing the Glow CPU JIT backend, and then we will also uh, look at some aspects of the uh, memory management for hardware accelerators. So, uh, why do we need the JIT at all? Well, obviously, as any JIT, it's definitely faster than an interpreter because it just eliminates all the dispatching overhead and it can perform some target-specific optimizations. And in fact, some vendors in their libraries have tried to use a limited form of JITing where they try to JIT a specific operation provided by the library. Obviously, if you try to apply the idea to the whole computation graph or the whole program, you can get even better results. And the main advantages is the ability to specialize the code for your concrete networking, uh, neural network model. The reason for that, as Nadav mentioned, we use a statically shaped IR, which means by the time of jitting, we know all of uh, the shapes and forms and dimensions of every tensor, which means that the JIT is able to produce a tailor-made code specifically for your neural network model. Now, let's dive a bit deeper into the CPU JIT design. So, for one, uh, our CPU JIT backend is heavily LLVM-based. So, we leverage LLVM optimizer, we leverage the uh, LLVM code gen and org JIT APIs, among other things. 
to be able to perform uh, the uh, neural network model and execute it, you need a set of uh, mathematical functions, a library of functions implementing convolutions, uh, pooling operations, matrix multiplications, and so on. And some frameworks for machine learning that use LLVM as backend, they try to emit the code LLVM IR for these operations on the fly when they JIT. But this is very uh, time consuming and error prone and very hard to write. So our idea was to implement those kernels in C and then pre-compile them into LLVM IR and use it later when we compile a specific neural network. The compilation starts uh, with this backend when we get LVM low level I, no, sorry, low, uh, low level IR as input, and we try to translate it into LLVM IR. This translation is pretty straightforward because we basically, in almost all cases, map a single uh, glow IR instruction into a, a single math library call, performing the corresponding operation, be it convolution, matrix multiplication, or uh, pooling. Then, once we have emitted the LLVM IR for the concrete neural network model, we also add the code of all those mathematical kernels that we pre-compiled into the LLVM IR into the same module, and we get now all what we need, right? But it's still not efficient. So we let a couple of uh, Glow-specific LLVM passes run over this code, and once they're done, and I will describe what they do in the next slides, uh, we let the rest of the pipeline, which is a typical uh, uh, LLVM uh, pipeline, handle the rest. So the optimizer will do the typical uh, optimizations like dead code elimination, inlining, constant propagation, and so on. And then the code gen will generate the code for the target architecture, and we can execute it. One of the uh, Glow-specific optimizations is the stacking of kernels. So what is it? Uh, many operations in neural networks are element-wise operations. You can have, like, for the whole tensor, element-wise multiplication, element-wise uh, subtraction, addition, and so on. And often you have chains of such operations executing on the tensors of the same shape. If you do this sequentially, you basically trash your cache because you do multiple uh, traversals of the tensor, right? And this is bad for performance. So instead, Glow tries to uh, generate a stacked kernel where all those operations are performed on each element in one tensor traversal. Below, you can see a pseudocode for uh, this optimization. As you can probably recognize, it's essentially a loop fusion optimization. Obviously, you can go further and do more complex kinds of uh, operator fusion. Another interesting optimization, and one of the most important ones in this backend, is uh, function specialization. So, as you remember, Glow uses uh, statically shaped IR. We know all the sizes, all the shapes, and all the types of all tensors. So, uh, we can basically substitute this constant data into the math kernels from the library. And by doing that, we can essentially specialize them for this specific dimensions or this specific type of the payload. This results in significant uh, performance improvements. On the picture, you can see that if you take a simple operation like finding a maximum element of a tensor and we generate the code for it without specialization, we get like a pretty long code sequence with some dynamic checks, with some control flow, and the performance is not stellar. Now, if we apply the static knowledge that we have, which is in this case, for example, the size of the tender we operate on, we suddenly see that the code becomes much smaller, a lot of runtime checks are eliminated, and uh, control flow is simpler, and the performance is much better. Besides this custom optimizations, the backend also provides a couple of nice features. One of them is the ahead of time compilation. So you can take your neural network model, you can compile it into a standalone object file with your machine code, and then you can link against this compiled model 
uh, your application. You don't need any further dependency on Glow. And this is very interesting for mobile deployments or for deployments in restricted memory environments. Another interesting feature is debugging support. Glow emits debugging information and it allows you to debug your neural networks in terms of Glow IR, not your machine code. Uh, on the right, you can see the snapshot of a little DB debugging session where you debug a neural network in terms of uh, Glow IR, and you can use all the usual debugger commands uh, for you know, printing the types, inspecting the values of the tensors used by uh, this uh, neural network, and so on. Okay, let's now have a look at the memory management for hardware accelerators. Uh, hardware accelerators are somewhat different from CPUs and GPUs in terms of how you manage memory. Why? For one, accelerators may have a lot of processing elements, uh, where a lot means dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of processing elements. And usually you have no caches, no out-of-order execution, and other nifty tricks that you typically have on CPUs, for example. When it comes to memory, accelerators often have a lot of uh, memory banks. Uh, and these memory banks have very different characteristics uh, in terms of their sizes and their memory access speeds. Usually, the faster your memory, the smaller its capacity is. The fastest memories are typically attached to those processing elements. Some of these memory banks have their own address spaces. And if you need to transfer data between some of these um, memory banks, sometimes you cannot do it other than using explicit DMA commands. This all complicates uh, memory management quite a lot. Uh, instructions may also have requirements on the placement of their operands. So some of the instructions insist on having their operands in specific memory banks. And some operations also require that their operands have a specific memory layout, which means that if the two subsequent operations require the same data in different memory layouts, you have to insert some kind of layout transformations. You cannot perform just your malloc or dynamic memory allocation on the hardware accelerator. You need to do all that statically in the compiler, and you need to do it per memory bank. So live buffers are allocated and freed, and the memory occupied by them is reused. And the scheduler and IR optimizer are trying hard to reduce the memory pressure and to shorten the lifetimes of the uh, buffer so that we can reuse more memory. It's very important because it allows you to run bigger neural network models in the same uh, hardware memory size, right? On this, okay. The video doesn't work. <laughs> the video was supposed to show uh, one memory bank and how the memory is used during a run of a, a neural network. The idea is that you would see that the same memory is occupied by different memory buffers at different points in time, which shows the memory use. Let's talk about memory management strategy. So obviously, you want to ensure that your buffers are loaded into memory banks as required by instructions, and then you try to keep them in these fast memory banks for as long as possible, right? You want to evict the, the buffers from these fast memories only if it's strictly necessary. Because it's very expensive and often it would also involve some DMA transfers. And you want to reduce the cost of those evictions. And that all sounds pretty similar, right? Right, because it's very similar to register allocation. In fact, the analogy is that if you uh, think about the buffers as virtual register, and if you think about fast memory banks as physical registers, and about buffer eviction as spilling, you see the perfect analogy. And even though it seems like it's the same problem, it's not quite the same. The reason is, there are differences, and the differences are, for one, the buffers may have different varying sizes, and the eviction of buffers, it's very expensive, it may require DMA transfers, and the time required for evicting a buffer from a fast memory 
is proportional to the amount of data you need to evict, which is different from typical uh, register spilling, where one spill has a constant cost. Uh, so you need to take it into account when you perform memory allocation for hardware accelerators. So how can we achieve the best performance? Well, you want to keep the processing elements always busy. They're very fast. You, want, you don't want to get the memory bound, right? To do that, you try to hide the memory latency. And how do you do that? Well, you do data prefetching. You try to intermix the data fetching operations with your compute, right? You also try to partition the data to fit in the numerous uh, memory banks available on the accelerator. And you try to use approaches like scatter gather so that you can both fit into these memories and also process them in parallel. And of course, you always try to reduce the amount of data transfers between different memory banks because they can be very, very expensive and they can kill you, uh, your performance. Obviously, to achieve all that, you need pretty good scheduler. On the right-hand side, you can see an example of a convolution kernel as it can be uh, looking like for a hardware accelerator. In the purple, you see the data fetching instructions. And in the blue, you see the actual compute instructions. As you can see, to get a good performance, we need to mix them and do prefetching to achieve the best performance. And now, uh, Nadav will tell a bit more about the uh, operation which is at the heart of almost all neural networks, which is the matrix multiplication, <laughs> because everything else can be kind of mapped to this single operation. It's very important that you can do it very, very fast. Okay, so we can't really tell you about the architecture of, of these accelerators because they're not public yet. But we wanted to give you a taste of how does it feel like to optimize matrix multiplication. So let's talk about matrix multiplication. On the screen, you can see two different representations for matrix multiplication. Um, at, at the top is a simple formula, and then at the bottom, you have some code. Let's visualize it. The idea is simple. You basically multiply, multiply each one of the elements on the row in the left with the column on the right. With, from matrix A and matrix B, you multiply each one of these elements and you accumulate them into a single value. And this is how you calculate a single element in matrix C. So it's pretty simple. Now, let me ask you a question. Can LVM optimize this code for me? Do you think LVM can do a good job by taking these three loops and generating the most efficient code? Well, no, it cannot. The default implementation is very, very slow. Very slow. The idea here is that we need to keep our FMA execution ports busy all the time. Now, but when I take the default implementation that LVM gives us, and I use a profiler, I see that the number of in vectorized instructions that are executed by the FMA ports is is not twice as the, or it does not equal to the number of executed cycles. It's far from it. And the problem is that we're not vectorizing. We're only using one element from our FMA uh, vectorized execution units. And we have two of these units. So what can we do? Well, the solution is to generate or to calculate not one element in matrix C, but a vector of elements. So the thing is that we do here is a little weird, but we take, we load an element from matrix A, we load a vector of values from matrix B, we broadcast vector A, we multiply them, and then we save the results to vector C. But things are about to get even more strange. Because this solution would give us at most 50% utilization on the CPU. Because you have two memory operations, you load from, from matrix A and you load from matrix B, for every arithmetic operation. So the solution here is to load um, two values from matrix A and two values or two vectors from matrix B and perform um, register blocking, which is perform the Cartesian project and a product and multiply all of these values from matrix um, B with all of the values from matrix A and then generate this weird patch in matrix C. Okay. 
but how do we know how many registers to take from matrix A and how many registers to take from, from matrix B? We need to look at the ratio between compute uh, and memory. So I, I plotted the table here with a bunch of different configurations and different options. Let's, look at, let, let's take a look at the first row. In the first row, we're loading one register from matrix A and four registers from matrix, from matrix B. Uh, so we have five memory operations and we're using five registers. And the result is uh, four arithmetic operations because we're multiplying four times one. Now let's take a look at the bottom. Um, the bottom row, on the bottom row, we decided to load three uh, registers for matrix A, three scalars, broadcast them, uh, and four registers for matrix B. We're using 15 registers because we also need um, to save some registers for uh, result accumulation. Um, so here we're loading seven registers from memory, but we're performing 12 arithmetic operations. So this is a much better configuration. And, um, we have a saying in the team, if you spill to memory, you're dead, uh, which means that uh, uh, we cannot use more than 16 registers, which is what we have on the machine. Okay, so now we know how we can generate a, a patch in matrix C. So we've optimized the innermost loop of the matrix and we know how things work. But now we have to start thinking about the efficiency of our cache. So the next thing to do is to generate, is to tile the matrix C. So we process tiles in matrix C and within this tile we generate a patch with the very strange dimensions. So think about what we're doing here. We're loading three scalars from matrix A, four vectors from matrix B. We broadcast the scalars from matrix A to generate this and then we multiply everything together to generate this strange patch and then we process matrix C in blocks that happen to match the cache, the cache size. So this is really weird. Um, but accelerators are even weirder. So after this talk, I suggest that you talk to Roman and he'll tell you about some of the crazy things that you need to do to make uh, matrix multiplications operate on, um, on the hardware accelerators. Okay, so summary. Um, this is Glow. Glow is a compiler for neural networks we make neural networks run on accelerators. Um, we are working with a number of hardware partners to make hardware accelerators available uh, to everybody, to the whole community. We are working on a number of exciting projects at Facebook. Um, in addition to Glow, we're also working on LVM itself, on HHVM, on Android, and a number of other projects, and we are hiring. So come talk to us after this talk. Thank you very much. And there's more information on the slides here. All right, now we're going to take some time for questions. I have a microphone here, or there's one set up in the middle. You have a question? Your part was great. Right. Uh, the buffer allocation into memory uh, that you were talking about, that's a knapsack problem, isn't it? Well, there are different ways to approach it, but this is one of the possible approaches. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think we next should... Uh, Take this question over here. So the kernels that you are optimizing are very regular. Uh, do you use the polyhedral model for that uh, in the compiler? Uh, we discussed about the possibility of using polyhedral models, but we decided that we are not quite convinced uh, <laughs> yet that it was the effort in the sense like uh, some existing compiler that use it shows certain issues with using it during jitting at least. So for JIT setup, it may be taking too long of a compilation time. For non-JIT uh, compilation, it may be a good idea. Um, I have a question more about uh, some user interface. Uh, so I'm not a machine learning expert, but uh, from what I understand, people will create models, uh, and those can run in floating points or with various quantization to yes. work with integer. Um, so if I want to use Glow to compile on GPU, like, is it like a user-defined option to decide, do I want to lower to integer my model or those kind of thing? Yes, it's a user-controlled option. Okay, and, and it's global? Like, you just say, I want to target int 8 or those kind of thing? Yes, you have to, because 
Um, some networks you can successfully quantize. So there's always an error. You always uh, reduce the precision of the network when you quantize. Uh, for some models, it's acceptable. For some models, it's not. So it, it's up to the user to decide. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, for the, uh, the uh, kernel stacking, yes. so it's purely based on the uh, LVM loop fusion, or is something that uh, you have to do yourself? No, in fact, we, we are not using the loop fusion. We produce like the already stacked loops when we generate the code, so to say, for these simple operations. We have more advanced versions, which are in development now, where you can fuse more complex kernels. Like if you have a convolution followed by Relu, for example, or something like that. You can like fuse the simple element-wise operation at the end of a very complex operation like matrix multiplication or convolution or something okay. like that. Actually, that leads to my second question is that um, the, the, what you're coming in is a DAG. So, um, right, so then the high-level representation of the DAG and they translate into the uh, low-level IR, then you do the stack uh, kernel stacking. So. The, uh, how do you decide which two kernels need to be stacked together? Because there are many, many different choices you can make. So what's the, the criteria you use to decide? So there are different strategies for the one that I presented today in the talk. It's just like you're supposed to see the sequence of, uh, uh, there's a sequence of element-wise operations performing on the equally shaped tensors. It doesn't need to be the same tensor, but they need to be equally shaped so that you have the same uh, congruent form of the loop, so to say, right? But like uh, this approach can be extended based on cost models. Okay, okay, you can yeah. take them offline. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. You talked about doing specialization by working constants through subprograms. Do you, you gain code savings, but you also have to replicate functions that would otherwise be general purpose. Do you ever have to worry about code size trade-offs? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> in fact, uh, we do. And <laughs> it depends, of course, on the network and if you want to really specialize all uh, kernels that are used by the network or the most important ones. Like if you do it really literally for all kernels and deep enough network, you may get the code blow, but it's very easy to tweak it to apply only for like uh, operations that consume most of the time because they're the biggest uh, uh, winners of this specialization. For the operations which are like fast anyways, you don't need to specialize them and blow the code without any purpose, right? Do you know that from profiling? We know that from profiling and by looking at realistic models, uh, we haven't seen like a huge amount of code blow, but yes, sometimes it can be an issue, and especially if you use it in combination with AUT and you want to run your network later like on memory constraint device. You definitely don't want to produce megabytes of code because you won't be able to deploy it there, right? Okay, last question. So uh, you mentioned in, at JIT time all the shapes are known, uh, so they are statically, uh, the, the shapes are static, uh, you know the sizes? Yes. So uh, have you considered to support dynamic shapes um, to like further down to the stack, maybe or maybe not uh, to the hardware? Yes, this is something we considered. Um, so, so it's this question is tied to, first of all, where neural networks are going and what kind of dynamic or what kind of dynamic shapes we see and and how efficient would it be to implement them? We have a couple of solutions. One solution is jitting. Um, we can figure out the shapes at, at runtime. Another solution that we started working on is predication. Um, by, by using predication, and we can turn off um, certain lanes. Um, the problem is un, unrestrained dynamic types everywhere uh, would definitely limit our ability to optimize the code. Roman explained memory allocation, and it showed, he showed how uh, effective, um, or he showed that we actually need to have static memory allocation. And when you have dynamic shapes that can produce any sized um, tensors, then you cannot perform this allocation. And then if you take a step back and say, well, let's provide an upper bound, then providing this upper bound is becoming equivalent to predication, where you say, I have this upper bound, but I would only calculate a certain portion of, of that shape. Um, 
that's the, that's a short answer. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe to add a bit more, you typically have dynamic shapes in so-called recurrent neural networks like RNNs and LSTMs that are typically used for machine translation. And uh, there is a whole wave of new research recently which tries to move away from RNNs and LSTMs used for neural machine translation <laughs> to something that is more like similar to convolutional networks, which somewhat alleviates this problem. And yeah, so basically upper bound and unrolling help for the time being, especially in machine translation where you kind of can estimate the longest sentence you're going to see or something like that, right? You, you can assume that it will be, I don't know, uh, less than 200 words or 300 words or whatever, right? You can even pre-compile for different uh, max batch sizes and stuff like that. All right, well, that's all the time we have. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you.